any type of impropriety at all uh, during the sequestration or during the deliberation process. Uh, Deputy Malio was in fact sequestered from the onset from the 27th and he is here to tell you that there was no type of communication at all possible that would have been made by any members of the sequestered jury. I had heard upstairs that there was some mention made of the fact that there may have been or was alleged to have been some type of communication. That was a physical <laughs> impossibility and Deputy Malio is here to confirm that. He personally was with them and it briefly if you had any questions about the treatment of the jury he will answer those also. Frank, I guess we believe you that that, that is in fact the case. Can you introduce you. the, the four-person of the jury? Uh, the four-person is not down here. Okay, well, uh, please introduce any of the members of the jury. I would like each of you to introduce yourselves if you can, please. Okay. Watch. Russ Fenstermaker. Jean Fisher. Elba Duggins. Arlene Urbaniak. Carl Stolle. Could we ask you to gather around the microphone and help us? We, we may look intimidating. <laughs> what was the toughest part of making a decision? Did he come up with a microphone? Yeah, just <laughs> gather around. Give me a minute to think about it. <laughs> or us to think about it. What was the toughest part about making the decision? I'm not so sure I would call it dissension, but a difference of opinion as to what constituted a mental disease, as to what was a mental disorder. Uh, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, I would not have affected the outcome of the verdict. What does that mean? You would have, you would have said you could, could have conformed to behavior? In my opinion, yes. Let me understand. You thought he had a mental disease? My interpretation of that. And you thought he could or could not have conformed to the law? He could. Conform to the law. I see. We're both descendants along that line. I cannot speak for the other person. Did it ever get past the first question? Was he saying or anything? Did you ever deliberate the second and third question? No. What convinced you he couldn't conform this conduct to the law? The evidence. Wait a minute. That he could or couldn't conform? That he could conform. Could. I don't want to go into detail on that at this point. How about your opinion of the doctors? What did you think of I thought they were all knowledgeable, well informed, and I you, you couldn't ask for better assistance in that field. Was there any feel, one witness that stood that? out above the rest? That, as, the, as one of the two defenders, how did you feel? Did you feel the seed? Was it a good natured argument? Was it was it tense? How, how, how did you take it? Like I said, it, it, in the course of our deliberation, it was not really as a dissension, but a difference of opinion. It, there, there was no arguing or you know, and nothing heated. I mean, we reached our verdict based on the facts. If anything, the disagreement was just on interpretation, but would not have changed the outcome. Is it you? I'm sorry. Yes. Could you step up here? Are you an alternate? Sir, I'm sorry, are you an alternate? Yes, I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. How would you have voted if you were going to you did have a vote? Um, I'm not sure if I want to make that a public statement right now. Had you made an opinion? Oh, yes. I, I, had, I knew exactly how I was going to vote on things. Would you have turned out this way the same way with your vote? I feel like rested. I think it, it would have turned out the same. But with not having known what everybody else thought, it's hard to say. How'd you feel about being an alternate after missing all this? It was tough. It's tough. What's what? this whole process been like for you during this particular case? 
My feeling is, I think I would feel the same way if it was any other case that I feel now. You're still affecting somebody's life, no matter what kind of case it is. Thanks, Chief. Can I ask elbow question? What, what, what went into making the decision? You were in the jury room with the deliberations. We all discussed it. There was no arguing. Everyone had their own opinion, their own way of interpreting. And that was the biggest thing was how we interpreted the evidence. The facts were there. We just had to act on those facts as presented by everyone. Was Did everybody's take... opinion changed during your discussion? I don't think I want to comment on that. Everyone had their own opinion, and if they want to speak on their opinions, that's what their about, business. What was the strongest fact that convinced you that he was seen? It's my own interpretation of the law, the way it was read to us, the judge's instructions. We had to learn, we had to interpret what the experts were telling us and what the law states. Was it his Change ability to plan, to connive, to plot? That was all presented in the facts, and we had to take that all into consideration. But you, can you tell us how you view that? That's my opinion, and I don't care to discuss oh, it. We all agreed there was a problem. Whether we interpreted it as a disorder or a disease was what we discussed. Elder, there was so much testimony during the course of it. Did you find your mind? Did you change your mind? I mean, were you going, I think maybe this way, now I think this way, and it finally got to the end of the case? Well, when you're listening to all these experts, and even the experts don't agree, your mind does have to go back and forth. You have to weigh each expert and what they testified to. What did you finally look at Jeffrey Downer you? during the course of it? Did, did his behavior make any uh, difference in how you were delivering this case? As far as how he was in court? Yes. No. How would you describe him in court? Quiet. You know, we, we were all asked by we were all asked by people we dealt with on television anyway. Well, how are the jurors reacting to this horrible tale that's unfolding day by day? And one question we couldn't ask you: How did you react when you just heard these terrible things day after day? What was going through your mind? Each one of us had to deal with it individually, but we at night came together as friends. We could not discuss the case with each other, which were our instructions, and we followed them. I want to know how you felt. I mean, our feelings are no different than what you go through. We felt terrible. Yeah, it was, it was a, a very different. mess. The hardest part was the waiting, not knowing what was going on when we'd be taken out of the room, even the initial choosing of the jurors. Some of us were sequestered from the first day. We had no idea what was going on from there on. The difference you just spent an hour with, the psych with <laughs> psychological support, psychiatric support. How much of that do you need? How much of it does it, does it help? The talking, the sounding board is always good, and one of the reasons they said they were there is they're also learning from this as to how they can help future jurors. What kind of toll did it take on you mentally to hear these gruesome details day after day? What, what does it do to you? <laughs> to have to listen to that, that kind of stuff for two weeks, what, what does it do to you mentally? Each one of us are going to react differently to how we're going to deal with it, whether it be to go home by ourselves and close ourselves off, which we're hoping by talking to you, we will not be pestered by phone calls. That's and the biggest thing. How will you deal with it? I already dealt with it partially by leaving the room and crying. So. Arlene, uh, you were an alternate. If you had been on the jury, how, how would you have gone? Would you have found uh, Jeffrey Dunn saying or saying, how would you feel about it? I'd rather not comment at this time. Would it have changed the outcome of the no. trial? No. It would not. No. Eileen, was it tough on you to hear, it was tough on us, was it tough on you to hear some of this? This is the most grotesque, revolting stuff I'd ever heard. No, I was kind of primed for it before I By the, was selected. The... On my own, I was primed for it. Was there any one of the doctors that uh, that you went back and said that maybe they were more credible or that their testimony maybe weighed a little heavier in your mind than the others? How much did Mr. Dahmer's credibility come in in the deliberations? Did you believe I wasn't part of the deliberations, so I don't know. I was an alternate. Sir, could we? Yeah. Excellent. Sure. 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 Sure.
name again, sir, is? Carl Stolle. Carl, one of the attorneys suggested that this, this was the uh, maybe one of the most important events of your entire life, of, of the participants' entire lives. Did you feel that way about this? Yes. How did that impact your decision making in all this? Uh, all we had to do is go by the facts, and then we came to a conclusion, and that's where we uh, decided which way. How long was it? For me, yeah, uh, it was. Why? Well, I think he was uh, a real con artist. <laughs> he even could fool police and get away with it. And from one standpoint, where he done this, he felt there's nothing to stop him. And if uh, the last victim wouldn't have come by and got loose on him, he probably still would have kept on going. So when the prosecutor says to you at the end of this trial, <clears throat> don't let him fool you. No. It was not important because... At that point, you had your I, mind made up early on? In the no, trial. it was not made up. We, uh, in the deliberation, we discussed a lot of points, and we came to the conclusion that he was not sick when he committed the crime. There were some very emotional... Were leaning, though, no, no. Very emotional, uh, very fiery closing arguments. Did it matter, or was it just no. the testimony of the doctors that made it? No, actually not because we had to go by the facts of each uh, uh, witness. Can, can you all agree on, on what was the most important testimony you heard, or was, was different, were different things important to different people? What was the most important part of it for you? Uh, I think in a whole overall picture, none was outstanding to show that, well, this is the, <coughs> excuse me, the turning point. Either he's bad or good. I think his whole conduct showed that he was a con artist and he had well planned and he is uh, above average and intelligent and uh, that's all we went by. I would say the words, yes, the professional words were confusing but uh, when we went down to basis, I think we figured out what was wrong. Mr. Stolle, on a personal level, how did, how did all this testimony affect you, all these gruesome details? Uh, I would say, personally, I think I'm lucky. I got a family to go back to, and um, I'm retired, so I don't have to worry about a job where other my colleagues uh, and uh, jurors, they have to go back like to an empty house all by themselves. I think that's a little harder. Well, because uh, uh, a lot of obvious doctors mentioned that mm -hmm. on examination of Dahmer, that he was above average. Mm -hmm. Well, he had, he had plans and he had just one thing in his mind to satisfy his ego and to satisfy himself. He didn't even think of anybody else, any feelings of anybody else. Do you think you're, you're, speak, you're speaking out with a little more detail than the others have, have spoken out so far? Is that, is your feeling, do you feel like a consensus of what the others yeah, I would. Away from yeah, the con artist part of it. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't want to mention the con artist, but <laughs> I think uh, I think he was a very smart con artist. How long did it take? How long did it take you before it was clear which way this verdict was going to go when you deliberated? You started last night after dinner. No, actually, we started this morning. You started this morning, so it only took you like four hours. Is that five hours? Five. A hours. little over five hours. No, we were too tired. How many lawyers did you have to change? You came up with ten or two. At one point, we were going like uh, eight and four, and as far as even seven, 
and five. That was always on the first question. Yeah. First, vote. first question. Yeah. Well, you, you only nope. discussed the first question. Yeah, right? we discussed the first question. There was no use. Did, did that number get more diverse as you moved toward the end of his uh, killing spree? In other words, murder 13, 14, 15. Were there more saying he was ill at that time than at no. the beginning? No. no. You saw no deterioration. No deterioration. Well, but you said you, you dealt with it your own way by by crying afterwards. Yeah. Was it a cry for the family? Was it a cry for was the cry for? Okay. For everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Was it your 65th birthday? Thank you very much for coming. Can you ever grab him, please? Carl, was it your 65th birthday? Okay. Can we, uh, yeah, we're going to get him home before his day's birthday. Open this up here. Can we get him off, please? They've been very nice to talk to us. Let them get home to their loved ones. Okay. We need to talk right through here. Are you going through there? Okay, right through here, please. Thank you. Step around here, please. I was going to talk about the possible crowd, but I don't have my. Be careful with wires, please. Hogan, be careful with wires. Hogan, out the window. We have with us two of the uh, psychiatrists who were counseling the jurors upstairs. I say we have two of the psychiatrists who were counseling the jurors upstairs. We're going to ask them if they'd like to step forward. If you have any questions for them, they're here to answer your questions. But you, that's a good question. <laughs> Gentlemen, go ahead and just uh, introduce yourselves to us. Thank you. Let's just let them introduce Identify yourselves. Go right ahead. Yes, my name is Dr. Roger Bell. I'm an professor in the uh, Department of Psychiatry, School of Medicine, University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I'm Dr. Ted Feldman. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Louisville Medical School. Dr. Bell, are we talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome with these folks in the jurors? PTSD among the jurors? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, we um, just got uh, finished uh, talking with them. And uh, on the whole, they look like a very, very uh, good, stable group of people. I was really impressed with uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm and a high level uh, of humor given the circumstances. And I think that's a good indication of uh, high quality mental health among this group. Based on your discussions with them, what kind of mental shape do you think they're in now as a result of the well, no one can really predict that answer, but uh, from talking with them, we were really impressed, and I obviously can't speak for Dr. Feldman, but we were really impressed with the fact that they've gone through three weeks of um, um, being separated, being uh, having had their social support systems decreased, having... Um, a number of normal stimuli that they ordinarily would get reduced and they've handled that really well now one of the one of the ways that they've handled that is that um, 
and it's really a unique phenomenon that we have found in other juries like those in Carrollton, Kentucky, and Louisville, is that this group, uh, uh, which is an ad hoc group, turns out to be a real group. And they provide all kinds of internal social support for one another. And um, they really care about one another. And that really helps them get through a lot of the disturbing parts of, um, of the trial. Do you find that true with most juries in cases like this? Yeah, the juries that we've had a chance to work with have all formed a very strong internal group, and that provides for for one another within the group the support that they're not getting normally from their families because they've been taken out of the, the home situation while they were sequestered. I think this particular jury had a very strong bond, and that's helped them to deal with the stress of the trial and the changes uh, in their lives that the trial has caused. Uh, and should ha go a long way toward offsetting future problems that they may have. What are the odds that, that, that uh, days go by and they reflect on the current that they begin to have PTSD or any kind of response? Yeah, I, I guess we just don't like to call it at this point PTSD. That implies a real sort of severe disorder. Okay, any kind of response. Okay, but there's, there's going to be, without question, uh, normal reactions to stress. There's going to be irritability. There's going to be uh, uh, sleeplessness. Many of them even reported that they had already gone through some of those. And those are, what's important about that is that those are normal reactions to stress. If you have an argument with a boss or a co-worker, you go home, you can't sleep at night, that's a normal reaction to that stress. And so they're going through some of that and they're going to have some re-entry problems. They've been away from their families. And they're going to go back into those families, and roles are going to shift. And there's going to be a little bit of abrasion, but I'm confident they can handle that. What do you think you're causing stress? What was keeping them up at night? Talk about any one thing more than others. Yeah, I think they, um, and I'll ask uh, Ted to comment on this too, but I think that this group was worried more about being separated from their families. I don't think they were as uh, disturbed by the graphic nature of uh, the situation as they were by being limited interaction with their friends and family and their support systems. What about nightmares? You mentioned sleeplessness. Did any of them express nightmares or any other problems that they had during the course of this? Yeah, that was mentioned by, by a couple of the juries, but it occurred more in the context of being taken out of their normal routine, uh, away from home, away from work. Uh, very different daily routines serving on the jury than they would otherwise. It, it didn't seem to have anything to do with specific material they were hearing or specific uh, things introduced as evidence. They may have this bond now, but they didn't really get a chance to express it or share it until yesterday when they deliberate. What does it do to that group when they listen for the better part of three weeks to all this grisly testimony and they can't talk about it? Quite the contrary, that, that bond really developed very early on because of what happens in, in the early parts of the instruction, the judge tells them that they cannot talk about the most significant parts of the things going on in their lives. So what they do is they start talking about personal issues and this groupness develops very early on in the, in the trial and that's something that we've observed in, in, in a number of trials. It's a real interesting phenomenon. One of the jurors mentioned that it would be perhaps a real problem for those who went home and empty homes or had jobs. What do you mean? What's, what's more difficult for those going home who don't have a family to go back to? A couple of the jurors uh, referred to this group as their family. That'll give you a notion about how important this group experience became to them. And now they're going to be separated from that family. And they're actually going to go home, uh, several of them, and be by themselves. So they'll have some separation from this group that's been really important to them for the past three weeks. And how will they deal with all this business when they have no one to talk about with? Well, that, that's one of the re-entry problems that the jurors have when they make the transition at the end of the trial back into their daily lives. And one of the purposes of our meeting with them was to, to begin to give them a chance to talk about those concerns and also share with them some things that they might normally expect. 
so that if they begin noticing those problems, uh, if future interventions are required, they, they'll know what to expect and know where to go for help. Uh, I th what, what I think is most important for them to realize is that even though right now they're very glad the trial is over and they're very anxious to get home, that they're probably not going to feel real great over the next few days. They're going to go back into a transition uh, into a very different role than they've had for the last three weeks. And they need to allow themselves uh, to get some rest, to, to not be bothered by people for a while, so they can kind of sit down and put this uh, event into some perspective. Uh, gain a little distance from it and reflect back on it. Uh, the um, state of Wisconsin made arrangements for us to come to. Uh, um, I don't know what program it was. It was just the state court system uh, of Mil of, um, of Wisconsin. During the course of the, of the testimony, three weeks, they heard such horrendous stuff. People kept asking us from the outside, do you think the jurors are getting numb to this? It's just getting meaningless to them. What's your response to that? Uh, we ask them precisely that question. And uh, each one, almost to a juror, uh, they were not really overly impressed that the graphic, horrendous testimony had that kind of influence on them. They felt that they had heard enough of that prior to the time that the trial even had gotten underway. So they were, in some ways, already sufficiently satiated with it. They were ready for it. I believe that's what they were saying. Well, that's kind of interesting because uh, we've followed uh, another jury now for over two years, and there are some of these things that this original jury uh, is still experiencing around um, the anniversary of the event and around the anniversary of the, uh, the decision. Um, like if they hear squealing of tires, uh, this was a bus, bus accident. So when they hear the squealing of tires, they see the replay of the event in their head. Uh, other events are, you know, gruesome scenes that every now and then will be shown by either defense or prosecutors and, and they'll they'll re-see that as an intrusive thought. This is not PTSD, though. These are normal reactions to stress, and a, and a normal stress reaction is on anniversaries of, of, of significant events, or when certain stimuli that are reminiscent of the traumatic event occur, that more memories, more feelings come back. Uh, for the most part, the, the jury we followed over a couple of years have done very well. Uh, but some of these stress reactions that Dr. Bell is mentioning are, are very common and will probably occur with this jury as well. Uh, that's really a, an interesting question. Now, we've debriefed other juries, but um, just in our own debriefing, we've spent the last uh, 45 minutes, I guess, trying to talk through and think through what this experience has meant for us. And I, I think this group uh, has a lot of similarities to the Carrollton bus tragedy group, to um, other uh, capital uh, sorts of um, uh, trials that we've been in, with the exception of the fact that I was rather surprised that the nature of this event did not seem to have the effect that I anticipated that it would have on the jury. No, I have not. Just the jury. I'm looking for Rob right now. Yes, <laughs> Uh, we were contacted through the administrative office by the administrative office of the court. 
Are we done? I think so. Get a good night from the guy from. They said to look oh, for you. Okay, then, then yeah, you're done. Uh, that occurred in uh, May of 1988. <laughs> yes, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>